All right, thanks everyone. We're excited to be here um, at day two of Lightship Summit. Uh, so we're gonna be showing everybody today how to build web augmented reality experiences using the Aethel engine and the Aethel platform, including our cloud editor. So uh, the agenda for our session here today uh, first, we're going to do a quick overview of the Aethel platform and features. I know if you were here for the keynote, you saw Tom talk about some of these things as well. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Aethel Discovery Hub, uh, which is where you can create a public profile and showcase all of the amazing work that you, you do using the platform. We'll take a look at the Aethel Project Library, which is a, a collection of 100 or so uh, sample projects that make it really easy to get started and developing with the platform. Uh, and then we're going to spend most of our time here today uh, doing live demos in the cloud editor, building web AR experiences, showing them live up here on stage, uh, and, and we'll go from there. And then we'll wrap things up with some Q&A. So before we jump in, a couple of intros. You know, we got already, we're kind of introduced <laughs> yeah, before getting up here on the stage. Joe did we'll, a great job introducing us. So I'll skip it, but I'm Tony Tamarchio, Senior Engineering Manager at 8th Wall. Uh, I'm Rigel Benton, Senior UX Designer at 8th Wall. So let's jump right in. Okay, so uh, what is 8th Wall? 8th Wall, uh, now part of Lightship. Uh, we love, by the way, to be now part of the Niantic family. This has been such an incredible, uh, was it two months now? Um, we've come such a long way. We already feel fully integrated. Um, and, uh, and it's so exciting to be here at uh, the very first Lightship Summit. Um, and so 8th Wall, as you may know, is the world's leading web AR platform for developing uh, and distributing web AR content. So of course, web AR being um, what we're gonna showcase how to build and deploy today, but uh, in a nutshell, it's all the AR that you would love to see, immersive experiences, accessible just from a link uh, in your browser. So really easy to scan a QR code and take you to a website, um, very snackable, lightweight experiences, um, and uh, yeah. All right, so uh, the mission for the 8th Wall team has always been to get AR in, his front, in, in front of as many people as possible, uh, and that includes you as developers. Uh, our mission has been to make it as fast and easy as possible for you to build amazing experiences that the world can enjoy. Um, and on the other end, uh, the mission here is also to make it as easy for our end users and the, the, the people that you want to get the AR in front of to be able to access and experience this content. Um, so that's really been the mission you know, over eighth, from the 8th Wall team over the past five years, and we're continuing to build upon that every single day. And uh, speaking of uh, our product here, we've got uh, sort of three core feature sets that are a part of the 8th Wall engine. And uh, we'll get into all the other products that we offer, but namely this is what we're known for. This is our bread and butter, which is uh, our own SLAM engine that has been implemented in JavaScript on a web browser. So uh, everything you're seeing in front of you uh, uses 100% eighth wall uh, in-house proprietary tech. There's no WebXR here. Um, you don't have to worry about any standards. Uh, basically how it works is you use uh, Git user media to access the camera feed, and then we process all of uh, these awesome features client side uh, in a single tab uh, in your web browser. So uh, over time, you know, what we started with was world effects where markerless AR, you can place content in front of you in the space, you can walk around, you get six degrees of freedom uh, tracking as you move through the world, um, and everything stays planted exactly where you would expect it to be. Um, we've made great strides over the last couple of years in particular over performance and stability of our SLAM engine. Um, and uh, most of our experiences on newer phones are, are running at 60 FPS, you know, as high as you can get the camera feed running. So performance has always been a core consideration of ours. Uh, image targets uh, can actually be used with SLAM simultaneously, which is an interesting um, thing to, to experiment with. And we've seen some really cool projects that can do that. Um, and notably, with image targets, we support both flat and curved image targets. So uh, flat, you know, being what you expect, oftentimes you see this like postcards, billboards coming to life, uh, movie posters, cereal boxes, uh, curved image targets working great for things like bottles and cans, um, and even uh, lamp posts and other interesting architectural features we've seen people use it with. Uh, and face effects, of course, you know, allowing you to uh, augment your face, attach elements to certain parts of the face, uh, as well as generate a face mesh that you can then use to decorate and modify with custom shaders. Um, and again, these things together can create some really compelling um, front-facing experiences. 
All right, so the eighth wall engine is really kind of the core of our platform, but you know, on top of that, we, we wanna make it easy from end to end to both, you know, we say create, collaborate, and publish. Uh, so in addition to the AR engine, which provides all these great AR and CV functionalities, uh, we also have an online IDE, we call it the eighth wall cloud editor. So this allows you to uh, log into your eighth wall account, clone templates, build right there with inside your eighth wall account, uh, and has integrated source control. It has a lot of great features like real time, wireless uh, debugging, uh, push button CDN publishing. So we have built in hosting, uh, which is backed by a global CDN with hundreds and hundreds of points of presence around the globe. So this is massively scalable. We support connection of things like custom domains. So if you wanna bring your own domain and, and, and use that free experience, all of these great features are supported. Uh, now, whether you're building an AR experience that's like a standalone microsite or integrated with your own you know, uh, e-commerce catalog, uh, the experience is either standalone or we also support embedding experiences as an ad, for example. So we also refer to this as inline AR. Um, where you can in, in, embed this directly inside of a page and not require the user to leave and go to another page just to see the AR portion uh, of your site. Uh, and then last but not least, we have a great discovery hub, uh, and this is where developers create uh, their own you know, real estate on eighthwell.com, showcase the work that you've done, and we've gotten lots of great feedback that this is a great way to get additional projects. People go to eighthwell.com, they can see what you've built, they like what you've done, and they contact you and hire you for a job. So it's a great way to get additional business. Um, and, yeah. you know, why would you choose to use WebAR, right? There's a lot of really great um, solutions out there. WebAR uh, it can do a lot of things that, um, you know, maybe that you're looking for for your next project. So one is the massive reach that comes with, um, you know, the web, right? So, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, because all of this is running um, in, within uh, the browser, and it doesn't depend on any native APIs. This means that it has incredible compatibility across browsers, and I've been able to run 8th Wall and some pretty crazy things, um, you know, Tesla uh, screens, uh, smart fridges at Best Buy, um, even 360 video cameras that just happen to run Android. Uh, it's pretty amazing being able to, you know, kind of just go to a website anywhere you are on any device um, and pull that up. And so that's definitely something that uh, appeals to uh, our, our, uh, our core uh, you know, customer base right now, which is advertisers who want to reach as many people as possible and they don't want to be uh, uh, encumbered uh, by compatibility issues. The creative freedom that the web affords you um, is quite high, so the, the ability to, uh, you know, no longer need an app store to distribute content means that uh, the sort of content you can create is a lot more open, just like the web. Um, and additionally, you know, this level of freedom also means that you know, uh, you can build content that leverages the power of the web, and we often talk about how we're standing on the shoulders of 30 years of web development principles and technology that you can tap into at any moment, right? CSS animations, responsive web design, React uh, frameworks, um, you know, Google Analytics to track user behavior in 3D, in AR, all of these things uh, can be leveraged and are quite useful for people who don't wanna try to reinvent Google Analytics for, for native. Um, and finally, of course, no app required, right? Uh, there's a huge barrier to entry, as we've heard from our customers, around um, getting someone to go to an app store, to download an app, uh, to discover that app, and then to wait uh, until it's finished downloading and installing before opening it and activating it, right? Uh, WebAR takes most of that out of the picture. You really just open up a link in your browser. It asks you if you want to access your camera. You hit allow, and you're immediately uh, placed in, uh, in the immersive space. All right, so who's using 8th Wall's tech? Uh, lots and lots of different companies. Uh, pretty impressive logo wall up here. This is just a small sampling of the types of brands that are using this and pretty much all verticals you can think of. Um, uh, I'm gonna transition here in just a second over to basically my laptop and show you the Discovery Hub, which is where a lot of these projects and information about them has been featured. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and uh, transition over to the laptop. Um, but yeah, so, so here what we've got is the 8th Wall Discovery Hub. So you can find it by going to 8thwall.com slash discover. Um, and there are lots of categories, you can browse by category. Uh, so you can see here lots of amazing projects. You know, a lot of the uh, folks who have created some of these are, are here at the conference here uh, uh, today. So uh, for, for these, you can drill in. They have information about, you know, they'll have videos. They'll have information about the, the particular campaign images, animated GIFs, 
Uh, some of them also have live demos. So if you click try it out, you can see all the projects that you can access. Click try it out, scan the QR code with your phone or if it's a, a mobile experience, uh, you can open it right up on your browser. So check out what other people have created and you know, maybe that's, uh, use that as some inspiration as to something you wanna build. And if you're wondering how to get started, uh, you know, you've seen the end state of a lot of awesome commercial projects. Uh, we actually have a, another area of the site called the Project Library um, where we've built uh, over 130 sample projects that help people um, achieve these great results uh, quickly and easily. So uh, on, on the Project Library page, you can see here, uh, this is the, an MRCS, Microsoft Mixed Reality Capture Studio uh, sample project. You can, uh, without even needing to log in, you can just go to 8th Ball right now. You can see the source code for all these projects. Um, you can uh, check out the readme, which describes the, kind of like the, the mini documentation for the project, how to get started, how it works. Um, and of course, you can uh, try it out immediately uh, on your phone to get a sense of this is like what you're thinking about pitching uh, or creating as a prototype or using as a, as a foundation um, for your project. And then of course, you know, one button uh, will allow you to clone that project immediately into your workspace um, and you can begin developing instantly, swapping out assets, uh, really all the stuff we're about to show you how to do. All right, thanks, Rigel. Uh, so uh, we're gonna switch over and start building WebAR live here on stage. So we're gonna start out with this project we called A-Frame Tap Ground or Tap to Place. Uh, where it's pretty simple, you just tap on the, the surface and it starts to spawn 3D models. So uh, I'm gonna switch over to the cloud editor. And in the demo here today, we're gonna go through a lot of different things. So first we're gonna start with world effects or AKA markerless or slam tracking. Uh, we're gonna add some additional 3D models, we'll add animations, we'll add gesture controls uh, and we'll build upon that. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the source control features, the publishing features, uh, and then we're gonna switch, and Rigel's gonna take you through image target demos and face effects demos. So uh, we'll try to get through as much as we can here today, so. And be thinking of questions uh, yes, as we go through. Yes, definitely. Okay, so I've cloned the project into my 8th Wall account, and here's the cloud editor. So in the left-hand column, we have all the different files, uh, and Rigel, why don't you pull up a preview um, I mentioned we have wireless previewing and, and remote uh, debugging. So this preview QR code takes you to a private development URL for this project. Um, he's gonna accept all the browser permissions and start playing with the demo. It's pretty basic, you just tap on the ground and it spawns a 3D model of a cactus wherever you tap on the screen with a cool little animation and you can see the you know, smooth tracking and, and this all is great. Uh, so Within the cloud editor, you've got you the ability to uh, upload different assets, whether that's a 3D model, images, videos. Uh, you can you know, add CSS, add custom JavaScript, HTML, things like that. So head.html is essentially where you're gonna import any packages or libraries. So here we're pulling in A-Frame, uh, which is one of the frameworks that 8th Wall integrates with. We also have integrations with 3.js, Babylon.js, and Play Canvas. Uh, we pull in the XR Extras package, which provides uh, a lot of great utilities like loading screens and error pages and things like that. Uh, and then a landing page module where if somebody tries to access the WebAir experience and they're let's say on a non-compatible device, it can show them the right way to get to the experience. Uh, if, for example, if it's a mobile only device and they access the link on their laptop, it'll display information in a QR code that they scan to get to the, to the right place. And some other scripts that we'll be talking about a little bit later. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is let's add a 3D model. So uh, I've taken a, a model of a robot uh, and I've, to get an asset into the editor is just simply a drag and drop from your, your finder window here. So I can preview it, you can look at all the different assets, models, videos, and things like that, and you can interact with it here. So I have some different components we'll talk about. Uh, we've got a couple different scenes we're gonna be switching through. Uh, and the first here is this world effect scene. So we've got our scene, uh, the XR web component is basically what's adding the eighth wall library and activating all these AR features. Um, then we have a handful of assets. So we've got our cactus model uh, asset here. We've got a camera in the scene. And one of the great things about uh, A-Frame is you can define your scene layout as basically nested HTML tags. So it's really easy to get started. We've got a light in the scene and we have this uh, virtual ground object, which is when Rigel taps on the, the ground, we're actually ray casting against that as to find the location to spawn the 3D model. 
So I'm going to go ahead and add another model. And just for the sake of time, I've kind of got this here, and we're just going to uh, un we're going to comment it here. So I'm adding a new entity. This is my model, and the uh, we're going to add the animated model asset. So here we go. We're adding the robot model to the asset list, so it preloads. Now there are a couple of components here. This uh, robot model has some animations built in. So we're going to use the animation mixer clip. We also want to enable some gesture controls so they can drag and, and, and move around and things like that. So let's go ahead and enable this. Now, when I click Save and Build, it's going to go ahead and build my project in the cloud. Uh, and once that's done, it's going to send a command to my phone to hot reload so that it automatically see, picks up the latest changes. So if you go ahead and, and do that, now we have this new robot sitting here in our scene. And you can go ahead and still tap uh, the Cactus 3D models around it. But also, Rigel, if you drag it around, you can, you can move it. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, I have to add the gesture detector. There we go. Live coding and debugging <laughs> here. So uh, I had the XR Extras gesture detector, which handles taps and swipes and things like that. Uh, so again, send a build. It's loading this, reloading the page. And now you can drag this thing around. There we go. You can do, that's much better. You can scale it. You can rotate it. Uh, and you know we did this with basically a couple of lines of HTML uh, and a script tag that we added to the page. So let's take this one step further. So now let's swap out the 3D model. So I've also uh, loaded in a 3D model of a cute little dog here. So we're going to swap out some things. And we're going to go into the world effects scene, and we're going to change cactus to uh, dog.glb. And uh, let's take a look at the tap play script. So what's happening under the covers is basically we're getting a handle to this ground object. We're adding a click event listener to it. And every time you click, we are creating a new element in the scene. And that's going to be the 3D model. So we're grabbing the intersection of the ray cast where you're tapping on the ground. We're picking a random ro rotation, so they're all in different, different spots. And once it loads, we basically animate it and make it visible. So let's, let's kick this off. And uh, the page is going to reload. And we're going to just start spawning different types of 3D models here. And then we'll add some interactability with these 3D models. And there we go. OK, so that one's facing in the wrong direction. They're just kind of facing in all different random directions here. So there we go. But Aww. they're not doing anything. Pretty cute. But there's animation <laughs> clips in here. We can't interact with it. Let's add those features to this WebAir experience uh, on the fly. So. Um, once the model is positioned and loaded, there's this event that fires called model loaded, and that's when we make it visible and we, we animate it in from a really small value to a larger value. Well, I'm going to add a couple of other things, so a couple of other attributes. The first is this class called can tap. So the raycaster on our camera, so that it's not raycasting against everything, we can tell it to just raycast and, and uh, intersect with objects that have a certain class. So that's what we use this can tap class for. Then we also want to be able to drag it around. So I'm going to add the XR Extras hold drag component, which is the one that was also on the, the robot model, that we can drag it around. OK, so if we do another save and build, it's creating an updated version of my project uh, hosted in the 8th wall cloud. And uh, there we go, page is reloading. And now when you tap to spawn the 3D models, you can drag them around individually and position them wherever you like. So let's go ahead and drag them around. And we're kind of creating this uh, fun custom scene here. Uh, but still, they're just standing there static, which is you know, not, not exactly what we want. So let's make this interactive. So what we're going to do next is add the ability, if you tap on an individual 3D model, it's going to start playing one of the built-in animation clips. So that's what we have here, is we're going to add another event listener on each individual uh, dog 3D model when you click. It's going to set the animation mixer attribute. And this only has one clip, so I'm going to use the star uh, clip. But you could decide if there's a specific clip that you want to play. Once again, we're going to do a save and build. And you know, here, with a couple of lines of JavaScript, a couple of HTML changes here, we've taken our template. We've added 3D models. We've added interaction. We've swapped and changed out assets. Uh, and there you go. So now it's animated. And it's going to play a bunch of different animation clips that are that are built into this, uh, this 3D model, which is, which is pretty fun. So now that I'm happy with my scene, uh, the next step is I'm going to check in my code into the integrated source control. So I'm going to land my changes. And once I land my changes, I can see a diff view. So I can see everything that I've just changed here up on stage. And I can give it a commit message. We'll say 
added robots and replaced cactus with dog, and we will land the files here. So this is gonna check in all this code into the integrated source control for your particular project. Looks like the dogs are having a lot of fun uh, up there. Uh, and once that's done, we can publish this live to the web so that anybody in the world can view this simply by clicking the publish button. Uh, we support uh, a public URL where anybody can view this. We also support password protected staging. So if you wanna preview what you've built with a client before it's released, you can publish it, give them the password, and they can access it without you know, the world seeing it. So I'm just gonna publish this to the public URL right now, click publish, and there we go. So the URL for this is you know, live.afold.app slash summit, um, and it is live on the web right now. So uh, Rigel, why don't we transition over to you now and go through image targets and face effects. Yeah, sounds great. Cool, thanks Tony. All right. Okay, so I brought props. <laughs> uh, here, yeah. I'll take these. You'll be the, the prop model here, great. I swear, I didn't drink out of this, you're good. Okay, we'll set this here for now. Okay. Awesome, so now that we're familiar with the cloud editor, um, we can start you know, using image targets. So um, first thing I wanna show you is over here on the left-hand side, uh, we have uh, the project view um, you know, where you can check out like, the stats and the QR code for how well your project's doing. We were just looking at the cloud editor. You know, we've got uh, source control, you can see hit the history, and then down right below that is your image target. So uh, image targets, uh, you can upload unlimited image targets per project. And, uh, and in fact, um, you, know, you can pull down any of these image targets in sets of up to 10 uh, sets um, if you've disabled world tracking um, simultaneously. So that means like as you're walking through the room, you can have uh, 10 targets that are up that it's always looking for, that if you can somehow manage to fit them all within the same screen, it'll track all of them independently. Um, and that is a mix of both flat and curved image targets. Uh, we don't delineate between the two uh, in terms of you know, what we're willing to track at once. Um, and then if you do decide you wanna include what Tony was just showing you with world effects, uh, and you wanna have image targets uh, in the same scene, we can support up to five image targets while running uh, world tracking at the same time, and, and that can do, that can lead to some pretty amazing things. Um, you know, you, you are on the, in the serial aisle, you scan the box, character jumps out of the box, lands on the ground, you know, starts leading you around the store. All of this stuff is possible when you begin combining these two uh, technologies. And so, for now though, I'm just gonna start with a pretty basic flat image target project. Uh, so, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna upload um, a flat image target. And uh, here I've got some, uh, some cool coffee-themed image targets for y'all today. Uh, I'm gonna upload this one first. Um, and so you'll see, it'll, it'll drop it in. You know, typically you wanna avoid using uh, you know, repetitive patterns, uh, reflective surfaces, you know, and, and uh, you want a lot of rich detail, rich varied detail uh, when you're selecting your image target, right? So here I'm gonna go ahead and upload this. And Tony's gonna go ahead and scan. This is called the image target tester. Uh, this allows you, before needing to drop it into your project or add any code, just see what the quality of this image target you just uploaded uh, can be. So here we go. Uh, it's found it pretty quickly. Um, he's tracking against it right now. Seems to be pretty good. Uh, you know, we tried it out before we got here, so <laughs> no, no mistake there. Uh, but, you know, this is a great way, again, for you to kind of like, a lot of uh, uh, customers are constantly getting samples from uh, you know, their brand clients, and they wanna be able to immediately provide feedback to them around whether or not um, you know, this object that they're gonna put in a store or you know, outside of an event is gonna track well, and this allows you to do that without needing to actually begin development yet. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Now that this has been added to our image target gallery, um, I can see that it's auto-loading, so this would be what I referenced earlier of the 10 or five that are being used at the same time. Uh, if it's auto-loaded, it'll just be brought in immediately. Um, if it's not auto-loaded, it's really easy, one line of code, you can specify what image targets you want at any given time, um, and without uh, even, a, even a frame stutter, it will swap out that new set, and, uh, and you can begin tracking the next set of image targets. Um, 
why is that important? Well, you know, maybe you have a, an art gallery. You want to activate hundreds of, of art pieces. Um, well, maybe the last art piece that they scan uh, has the logic to load the next set of 10, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of interesting ways that you can kind of seamlessly uh, continue to flip through these sets so that uh, end users uh, aren't aware that behind the scenes you're swapping through these image targets. Okay, great. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to swap the scene out from world effects to image targets. And in our image targets.html, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show the preview for Tony to scan. Okay, we scan this. There we go. And right out of the gate, what we should see is uh, the mug target that we just uploaded uh, is going to be uh, oh, track. Oh, I need to save and build. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that big purple button We're was We're still looking me. at the, uh, the old version with the dogs. OK. So hot reload. Still fun. Yeah. Still, okay, there we go. Dogs are still having a blast. There we go. All right. So here we go. We got, the, we got a purple cube. Uh, track to our image target. Um, now what's happening here? Well, we've added this XR Extras named image target. So he had referenced some other XR Extras components. Uh, these are just a really great helper library that we've created. Uh, it's open source that can allow you to uh, add this kind of functionality easily and quickly and customize it. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Basically, anything inside of uh, this uh, HTML tag is going to be a, a, a child of this uh, tracking feature. So um, here, all I've done is just add a box, and you can see it's just being tracked uh, to the image target. Uh, if we wanted to create more children or offset transforms, it's all very easy to do. Um, and if you're familiar with a Unity workflow, uh, this is very similar to like, the game object hierarchy idea. Um, it works exactly the same way. It's just done through declarative HTML. Um, so this is cool, but we want to get a little fancier. So instead of having a box, let's put a mug uh, inside. But let's not just show a 3D object of a mug. Let's add some interactivity to that as well. And so uh, here, I'm going to go ahead and uncomment un, uh, the XR Extras gesture detector. Yeah. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and save. Well, actually, we need to add the asset. So in my A assets, this is what he was swapping out a moment ago. I have a mug GLB file, which I'm going to uncomment. And now we're going to hot reload. And this time, we're going to replace the purple box with our mug. Um, and you might notice, too, that the mug, in this case, is actually a child of, there we go. Uh, it's a child of another, yeah, and you can spin it around with your finger, get the best angle for that, that great uh, promotional shot for your new cafe. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's a child of this parent entity which has a rotation offset. So uh, this is great because it's like, it's really easy to just kind of, again, like in Unity, you create an empty game object, you want to create an offset, like it, it behaves very similarly. Um, and so, you know, now uh, we've done flat image targets. That's great. Let's go on. Let's move on. Let's do something a little trickier. Let's do a, uh, a cup. Now, you'll notice that this is curved, but it's not just curved. It's conical in shape, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and show how to upload a conical image target uh, and track that. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my image target view. You're going to go ahead and hold that. And then I'm going to add uh, a conical target. So, um, you know, conical uh, targets that require both an image target that we just uploaded with flat, but also it requires a little bit more information around the shape, the curvature of this. Um, but we've made this really easy. So I'm going to go ahead and upload. Uh, this is a picture of the coffee sleeve. Um, I've kind of cropped off the edges, but this is kind of what it would look like, right, if you're going to take a photo of it laid out on the ground. We call this uh, a rainbow image internally. I don't know if that's like the real term to describe it, but everything kind of looks like a rainbow with the conical targets. Um, so here we've got uh, our coffee uh, image and Next, what it's going to do is it's going to ask us to align the curves. So there's a top arc and a bottom arc, right? And so instead of needing to like get out your measuring tape and your I don't know protractors and get back to high school math, like you can instead just like drag this nifty slider and align the red line, uh, and then you're like, okay, that looks pretty good. And then now you're going to go ahead and align that blue line to the bottom. Um, hit next. Cool. So we've got everything we pretty much need uh, to upload this. So I'm going to go ahead and create this. Next, we're going to see 
um, similar to what we saw before with the flat image targets, a QR code that will take you to a curved image target tester and a 3D view, right? Um, and then well, the other thing you'll notice is we've got these sort of two different inputs, right? We've got a slider mode and a measurement mode. Measurement's probably what you expect. It's like, you know, you want to measure this, get the measurements perfectly right, you know, but it turns out that eighth wall curved image target tracking is pretty forgiving. Um, you know, even though this doesn't look right, it's still tracking pretty well, but we want it to like fit around the, the curve of the, of the cup, right? So I can actually just go ahead and change this slider and I can make it look a little bit better, right? And then if you reload the page, it'll get the latest and greatest. Um, and we can see if we're getting oh, closer, better. right? So here we go. Um, you can kind of eyeball it, right? This is, again, something that we, uh, we wanted to make really easy. Um, and we didn't want people to have to sit there with all their, you know. Uh, when I was working on this project, I became really frustrated with all the measurement stuff. And I was like, what if this was just a slider? Um, and so if you have the measurements ahead of time, of course, you can go ahead uh, and type these in. Um, and again, this is really easy to do. You'll notice it keeps generating a new QR code, so if you reload the page, it should have, again, those, those, those values in place. Cool, so it's perfect. We're gonna continue. I'm gonna close this out, and then I'm gonna go back to our cloud editor, back to our image target scene, um, and then I'm gonna uncomment out the same basic code that we were just using for the flat image target. This is now just referring to the coffee sleeve. Um, and then I'm gonna uncomment some other assets to make this uh, a bit more interesting. Okay, cool. So, save and build. And what we should preview. see next. Let's scan the preview code once more. Oh, yeah. There we go. So, now if you point his phone at the mug, instead of a purple overlay, we'll get whoa, it's like a portal inside the mug. Uh, <laughs> And it's doing a lot of crazy stuff in there. So um, this is kind of a, a collection of fun uh, helpers that we made. So this one's called a curved target container. And what it does is it takes the, the curvature, the metadata that we just input when we did the upload, um, and then it generates uh, several different cylinder objects that are right, exactly the right size. And then uh, it has some occluder materials in there. And so again, one line of code, and you can just start putting stuff in this coffee mug, right? Um, and we have just some really basic 3D models that are just rotating along the y-axis. Um, oh, but, you know, let's not forget, we want to do the, the other mug at the same time. Let's see if we can fit it all in here. There we go. They're all being tracked independently. They look great. Yeah, these, these image targets pair well together, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Definite theme here. Cool, so uh, that's image targets. Uh, and now we're gonna roll on over to face effects uh, before Q and A. So face effects. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, scan that preview code. Change your app.js. Yep. Okay. I will need to do that. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna change over to a new scene. Face effects. And then I'm gonna hit save and build. Let's okay. see what we got. It's reloading once again. Cool, all right. So, we've got a couple things going on here, right? We've got a nice face tattoo, that nice appless. Uh, eighth wall logo, you know. <laughs> yeah, to get the eighth wall logo, it's great. I think there's a load spinner, actually, on the other eye. It's, it's being obscured by our, our 3D glasses. Oh, yeah. So, so, what's going on in this project here? Let's see. Um, so, we're loading in some textures. We're loading in a few different objects. Uh, so one thing is we have this head occluder GLB, which is kind of fun. So this one, it kind of looks like roughly like a head, um, and it has a, a, an occluder material applied to it. So that's why when he turns his head, you're not seeing the, the back of the glasses clip through the other side of his face. So you have this sense of you know, where your, your head is, where your face is. Um, what else is happening? We have uh, the glasses, which are being appended to a, uh, a point in space, uh, on the face, called nose bridge. So there's over 40 of these attachment points, is what we call them, uh, that you can select from, and they're all over the face. And in fact, I have a, uh, a diagram in here that you can, uh, you can check out, which shows you the underlying mesh that's, that's generated and the vertices that you can pin things to. Um, and so uh, what else is happening? Well, so not only do, are, we, are we appending 
the uh, glasses to his face, but we also have this really cool face tattoo model, um, and it's fit to the contours of his actual face, right? And how that's done is uh, we generate what we call a face mesh from the information that we know about the face, and uh, that face mesh can then be modified at runtime to include all kinds of really cool effects, uh, vertex shaders, you know, where you can have various things happening with your face, uh, like popping out. You can also do some pretty awesome, uh, you know, uh, lava textures and video textures, and we have a few different sample projects that really go into all the crazy stuff you can do with this. Um, but for now, uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna add some physics uh, to this. And you're probably wondering, like, how do you add physics to a face? Well, uh, I'll show you. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do uh, at the top here is we're gonna turn on ammo. So ammo.js is a physics engine that re works really well uh, with A-Frame. And, uh, and we're gonna go ahead and add some assets in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a pirate hat and a, and a skull chain uh, that dangles from your head as you move it around. Here we're gonna go ahead and add that physics collider uh, for the head so that when the chain is dangling, it's, it's colliding against his face, it's not clipping through his head. And then uh, we're gonna turn on the pirate hat, the most important piece, really, and then the physics chain. Okay, cool. Um, let's go ahead and turn that on. Arg, there you are. <laughs> cool, so yeah, there's that physics chain in action. Um, this is really easy to make. Uh, I have a component in here that shows you how this works. So uh, basically it spawns uh, each object in that chain and it assigns uh, a chain constraint to each uh, element in the chain. You can make this as long as you want to. Um, I actually, I did not, I haven't tried this before. Let's just see what it, what it does. Longer chain. Let's just make a really long skull chain. There we go, hot reload. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, well, it looks great as is. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> it was a risk, it's fine. Um, and uh, so, cool, so like, this is great, but what if you wanna share this with your friends? Obviously you can share the link and then they can open it up uh, and try it out for themselves, but you know, if it's, a, if it's the selfie, it's like you gotta have a selfie cam in there. And so, that's a, another thing that we've built is we call it uh, media recorder, and uh, what it does is allows websites to record um, highly performant video and photos um, within the experience. Of course, this doesn't just work with face effects, this also works, uh, you know, in world effects and anything else. So, Tony, if you go ahead and, you know, record your face, have a great pirate time, and what it'll do is it'll generate a video uh, client side that you can then share. But not just that, it can encode uh, watermarks, end cards, and as we'll see as this plays back, uh, we've got an eighth wall logo in the corner and in, in an end card at the end that is fully customizable with a call to action so that if you share it uh, on, on you know, various social networks, then end users know how to reach this and know how to get access to it, um, even without a link. Um, if you hit the share uh, sheet, Icon. So uh, this works just as you'd hope. You can save it to your camera roll. You can share it immediately uh, on social media and, uh, and all that. And one, one last thing I wanted to showcase is if you keep your phone running, okay. um, if I go into the console and I check out the device here in our wireless debugger, there's actually this really cool toggle that says debug mode. If I tap this, it'll show what we call debug mode, which is um, all these awesome diagnostic information um, that you can try out uh, right here on device. Um, it's streaming in all the console logs, it's giving you your FPS, and I think we're getting an error, probably because of that like 30 chain thing I was doing earlier. Um, let's switch back over as I talk about this. So on the top right hand corner, you'll see this is the version of the eighth wall engine and then the version of the render that you're using. Um, in the top left, you'll see a frame rate counter um, and then when it's uh, unfurled, uh, it should uh, show you some more information about the scene. So this is actually really helpful when trying to debug something, right? Like why is my performance not what I wanna see, right? Um, you, you can see the try count that's, that's in the scene. Uh, you can see the number of draw calls that are being made, the max texture size, how many, the size of the models that are coming in. Um, you can even uh, open up the show detected surface. This will show you what eighth wall scene, to help you understand where the floor really is in the space. 
uh, as, it's, as it's moving through. Um, and if you click on that camera tab, you should see where the virtual camera is in space. So maybe your model isn't showing up exactly like where you expect. Uh, well, maybe the camera is rotated in a weird way, and you know. So anyway, so this is something that uh, a lot of our customers have found really valuable, and just really quickly getting a sense of uh, what's going on in their project, diagnosing it quickly, um, and of course having a whole slew of different phones up where you can see all these different stats across Android and iOS, desktop, VR, AR, HMD through metaversal deployment, uh, which we didn't quite get into today, but uh, please be sure to go and uh, check all that stuff out on our website. And with that. This is, uh, I think we're ready for Q&A. Awesome, thanks, Rigel. Thank you. So we have about five minutes left for Q&A. Just a quick recap. We did an overview of the Apple platform. We talked about kind of the features and the end-to-end uh, -end development capabilities. We talked about the Discovery Hub where you can create your own uh, public profiles on apple.com, feature the great work that you've, you've, you create. Uh, the project library that has over 100 sample projects and templates with access to code, readmes, uh, animated GIFs, live demos, and the ability to clone it into your project get started. And then we went through a bunch of demos, world effects, image tracking, and face effects. So thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, if there are any questions, please step up to the mic. I right. uh, just got two quick questions. Sure. I was wondering, just with the world, uh I already forget what it's called, but um, like how many, we'll, we'll use this, the dog as an example, how many 3D models of them can you reasonably place in the scene before you start exploiting people's devices? A good question. So, I mean, there's a couple different factors there. There's the complexity of the 3D model itself. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the texture sizes, polygon counts, things like that. Uh, and then also, like, there are thousands of different types of phones and they have different memory profiles. You know, the phone only has so much memory to load these assets in. So, you know, there's a couple different variables. So I can't say like, oh, you can do exactly this, this many 3D models. Um, it's gonna vary, but uh, you know, you, you wanna test it out. Thing. Yeah. 40 chihuahuas. 40, yeah, that, that sounds right. You know? There we go. Um, and then for like the, the conical and the curved image targets, um, what would be the easy, like let's say I just got like a Coke can, I just want to mess with it at home. What would be the easiest way for me to like kind of get that into an image to upload without like having to cut the can open or yeah, good question. something like that? Uh, yeah, so actually cutting the can open is a pretty effective uh, way to do it. I've done that before. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes when you're like activating experiences for a brand, they'll send some kind of sample or PDF that has like the actual image before they send it to manufacturing. Um, and so, you know, with things like that, that's typically how it is. Um, but, you know, that said, it's like a Coke can's pretty easy to like Google and get that unwrapped image. Um, I've experimented in the past with like taking an actual image, dropping it into Photoshop, and then trying to like, you know, flatten it out. But that's like mixed results. What you really want is that original image that's then used to wrap the the can. Um, you know, one thing that's kind of fun is like if you take a poster and you just have the image of the poster, and then you go and you wrap it around like a tree. Um, that works really well too. So, uh, but yeah, you want that source image to be flat originally. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Do you have any APIs that we can use to inject things directly into what we're just looking at? So do we have any APIs to inject things? Inject, uh, inject code into what, into the files that you were just working with your editor. Uh, so we currently don't have an API to like add, upload the 3D models and things like that. We do have an image target API so that you can create and uh, uh, update and delete the image target library. That's a great you know, feature request. Um, as far as like the APIs that you then incorporate into the experience itself, I mean, it's kind of limitless. You know, you want to pull in, you know, any other web library out there. It could be as simple as a script tag in head.html of your cloud editor project, and you pull that in like you would when you're building any, you know, a normal website, if you will. Do you have any different kinds of gesture behaviors you can use on the objects to tap or slide? Yeah, so that, that XR Extras gesture detector component handles things like one, two, three finger, you know, swipe, uh, tap, pinch, pinch things like that. Um, the, the XR Extras library, you can find that code on GitHub and you can see what it's doing. And if you want to modify it, create your own version of that, you could certainly do, you could certainly do so. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Hi. really Hi. awesome talk. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, I, coming from WebGL and WebVR and WebXR, I really like my low-level 
uh, like render loop access, as well as being able to pull arbitrary components from the larger 3JS code base that's yeah. not necessarily in the main. Uh, and I see a lot of abstractions here. So like, is that still available to me, and, as well as like absolutely. changing 3JS versions? Or yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in this demo, we were using A-Frame, which is basically a wrapper around 3JS. We have a direct uh, integration with 3JS as well. Uh, we have our own 3JS module, which like you know drives the camera and he does all the lifecycle methods. You could even create a custom version of that with your own you know uh, render loops and things like that. Um, and as far as the version goes, in if you're using the cloud editor in that uh, meta tag for the package, you could say 3JS colon and then the version that you want. Uh, so you can specify that. Um, yeah. The meta tags are basically just fancy. Uh, they're just wrappers for the actual CDN tag where the you know 3JS with the A-frame library is coming from, so you don't have to remember URLs. So. And we should also mention we also support Babylon JS and Play Canvas and self-hosting. So if you didn't want to use the cloud editor, you're still free to access uh, the engine directly through our engine APIs. Um, you can roll your own render effectively if you wanted yeah. to. Very cool. Well, I can't wait to jump in. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have my homework on the flight back home, so I'm really looking forward to creating something. Excellent. Um, how, how much uh, more in the process, um, how much more involved is it to incorporate VPS into the project? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we announced uh, Lightship VPS for web uh, yesterday, John did, and uh, we know that it's coming soon, uh, but we can't share any specifics at the moment around uh, how that integration works. Um, but uh, I put together the video that you saw yesterday, so I've been using it a lot, and I can just tell you that I'm really excited uh, to, to share this with as many people as we can um, and make the web, uh, you know, VPS ready. Great, thank you. And, and our goal is to make this as easy as possible. So you saw in the demos today that we had, like, uh, HTML primitives that you could just put into a scene that, that do pretty complex things on the covers. So wherever possible, we would like to release components or primitives or modules that just you know, take away a lot of the underlying details, implementation details. So the goal is to make it easy. Thank you. Cool. cool. Great. Well, we're out of time. So thank you all for coming to our uh, presentation today. And we hope you enjoy the rest of Lightship Summit. Thank you.